Behind a strong start from Colby Aller, the Atlanta Braves sweep the Minnesota Twins on a Wednesday, and we are now at the mathematical halfway point of the season. So let's hand out some first-half awards on today's episode of Locked On Braves. So let's get into it. You are Locked On Braves, your daily Atlanta Braves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, and welcome back to Lockdown Braves, part of Lockdown Sports Atlanta, where we cover your favorite Atlanta sports teams each and every day. I am your host, Jake Amastriani. You can follow me on Twitter at shortstopball. Also, check out my written work over at bravestoday.com. Make sure you follow the podcast on Twitter at lockdown underscore Braves. Send in any questions, comments, or feedback that you have for the podcast. We're going to have our mailbag episode tomorrow, so look for my tweet from Lockdown underscore Braves to submit your questions to be answered on that podcast. If you're new on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, hit that thumbs up button as well if you're watching there to help support the show. And thank you to everyone out there who makes Lockdown Braves your first listen of each and every day. And thank you so much to all my everydayers out there. If you are an everydayer, let me know down in the comments section on YouTube. And I do, again, appreciate all the support. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. On today's episode, we'll recap Wednesday's game, where the Braves got a surprisingly really good start from Colby Allard and just enough offense. A lot of it supplied by Matt Olson to finish off the sweep of the Twins. We'll discuss that, and then we're going to dive into our first half awards as we do our Thursday through the league segment. On today's episode, we're really one game shy of the mathematical halfway point, but we'll have our mailbag episode, as I mentioned, on Friday. So go ahead and do it today. On today's episode, we'll hand out our first half awards. Let's start with Wednesday's game, though, an afternoon game. Braves win it three to nothing. Sweep of the Twins. It felt kind of easy. I, I mean, I don't mean any disrespect to the Twins, but after what we witnessed in Cincinnati, where it was just a battle and it was an exhausting series a word that i used a lot after that one it's just felt like business casual i mean they just kind of ran through the twins that was my immediate feeling and reaction after the game on wednesday it's just it was a three nothing game it was close but it just felt like the braves taking care of business we're going out there to win another game and it never really felt uncomfortable it just felt like the braves were gonna win they scored that first inning run and even though you had Colby Allard on the mound, weren't sure what you were going to get, just never really felt like the game was in jeopardy. It was just one of the more unusual feelings. I don't want to take all these wins for granted, but it just it felt like a casual win. Like the Braves just went out there. They knew they were going to win. Uh, you played the game. It was a really quick game. I think that was part of it too. And it was just there was really no threat, I felt like, imposed by the Twins in this game. And it felt like the Braves just kind of – Casually went out there and won a 3 nothing game. They've now won five in a row. They're 20-4 and four in the month of June. They're just one win away. If they win the game on Friday, they'll have 21 wins in a month. That'll tie their franchise record for wins in a month, with which they set last June. So that was, that's what the Braves will be going for on Friday when they face the Marlins. Now let's get into this Colby Allard start. We discussed yesterday a bit of a, a head-scratching decision by the Braves. I know a lot of us and a lot of media members thought Michael Soroka would get called up for this start, but Braves threw us a curveball as the front office typically does. And they went with Colby Allard and certainly paid off. And again, even, even as I said yesterday, while it was a head scratching move, I trust this front office that they know what they're doing. They've proven themselves to be correct more often than not. So fully trustworthy in the decision it's just one I don't think a lot of people saw coming. Not that Colby Allard couldn't get it done, but the fact that he hadn't pitched in a while and after getting hurt in spring training, two rehab starts, not, neither one of them, he went more than four innings. So you knew you weren't going to get a lot out of him. I said going in, if you could get four innings out of him, I thought that would be a huge win, and he did more than that. He was absolutely tremendous in this game. Four and two-thirds innings, three hits, one walk, no earn, and eight strikeouts he threw 71 pitches 52 of them for strikes he was filling up the strike zone 14 whiffs on 37 swings that's a 38 percent whiff rate 
six of 14 whiffs on the four seam fastball. Talked about this on the postcast. I think the reason for that is because the off speed stuff was so good. The curveball in particular, I thought was great. Um, they label his other pitch as a cutter. It kind of feels like it has more slider movement to me, but either way, I, I thought the curveball was fantastic and he did a great job of dropping it just below the zone got several misses on it with just below the zone that thing was falling off the table it's a it's a strike for 50 feet and then it just suddenly drops off the table below the zone I thought it was a really great pitch for him and that really set up that four seam up in the zone again when you're tunneling it with that curveball that's dropping off the table and you tunnel it with a fastball up, even though it's a, it's a fastball at 90, 91, not a high velocity fastball. But again, when you're tunneling it off that curveball, like he was, I thought that was great. I thought it was a great game plan by Travis Darno behind the plate. I really thought he did a great job getting Allard through that 15 called strikes as well. Like I said, pounding the strike zone, even even when he didn't get ahead, there were a couple of at-bats, not a lot, where he'd fall behind 2-0 or 3-1, and he worked himself back into the at-bat. Again, only had the one walk on the day. Pretty even pitch usage between that four-seam cutter, curveball. Like I said, the cutter to me played more like a slider, but either way, you know, pretty even pitch usage between those three, keeping hitters off balance. Uh, the other thing uh, – you know, that I, you know, really enjoyed about Colby Allard again is just the way that he attacked a guy that hasn't pitched in a while, hasn't started a big league game in a long time. And to be able to get called up like this last minute, you probably heard the story after the game. He was in Minnesota where the AAA team is playing. He arrived there on Tuesday, quickly had to turn around, get on a plane, go back to Atlanta where he arrived at midnight and then had to pitch in an afternoon game. So, for him to be able to come out and perform like this, one thing you do have to point out, not just with Colby Allard in this start, but with the entire series, this Twins offense is not great. And I think that was pretty evident as we saw. They're on you know, a pace right now to, to be the you know, worst strikeout team in the history of baseball. We saw that a lot. So I don't want to take away too much from what the pitchers did in this one because, like I said, I loved the game plan that they had with Colby Allard playing off that curveball setting up that fastball up in the zone getting a lot of sw uh, swings and misses on that but this twins team this twins offense is just not very good so you do have to take that into consideration but it looks like perhaps colby allard's earned himself an opportunity to get another start at the big league level as he remained on the roster after the game and they sent down jared schuster which i'll talk more about later but it looks like colby allard could get another start i think there's an opportunity for him to stick around maybe as a long reliever like he was used with the Rangers last year. Gives you another lefty, although he has reverse splits in his career, so I don't know that that gives you you know, a true lefty in the bullpen, but somebody who could definitely fill in that long reliever role until Jesse Chavez is back or certainly until you know the starters, Max Fried and Kyle Wright, come back. On the offensive side of things, Matt Olson delivered in this game a couple of times and I did a podcast not too long ago saying is Matt Olson good and basically in that episode I said yes because he does exactly what you need him to do he gets on base he hits home runs he drives in runs it, it is somewhat of a three true outcomes player and as I said on that podcast I think something that Braves fans struggle with is they want to compare him to Freddie Freeman he is not Freddie Freeman he is not that type of hitter and that's okay because what he does do well, he does really, really well. And you saw it in this game. I thought he did a great job in the first inning. It looked like the Braves might not score in that one after Ronald essentially let off the game with a double as he walked and stole second base. But it looked like he was going to get stranded on third with two outs, but Matt Olsen gets himself in a 2-0 count, sits on a Kenta Maeda heater up in the zone and drives it into the right center field gap for an RBI double I thought that was a great job by him then he had a big home run in the eighth inning to give the Braves a little bit more breathing room even though like I said I never really felt like this game was in question even with how low scoring it was he seems to be enjoying that four fifth spot in the lineup he's really settled more into the four spot right now which is where I think he probably needs to stay but since moving out of the two hole, he's hitting 286 with eight home runs, four doubles, and 17 runs batted in. His 26 home runs before July are the second most in franchise history behind the big cat who hit 27 in 1999, Andres 
Galarraga. Um, so you know, he had the chance to either tie or break that on Friday night. The Braves are also one home run shy of tying their franchise record for home runs in a month. So that's also what they'll be trying to do on Friday night against the Marlins. Another thing I wanted to point out here, that 9-1 punch in the lineup we've talked about a lot lately, Michael Harris and Ronald Acuna Jr., what they're able to do. And I know there's a temptation to move Michael Harris out of that nine spot now that he is hitting, but it's just it's so electric to have those two batting next to each other. Maybe you put Michael Harris second and you still have them batting next to each other, but I, I love Michael Harris getting on in front of Acuna because it just – it feels like Acuna is going to get on every time he comes up to the plate. And if Michael Harris is on and Acuna splits a gap, that's a run. If Michael Harris gets on, steals a base, Acuna gets a hit. I mean, that's a run. You get both of those guys on the base pass together and anybody gets any type of hit, it's possibly two runs. So, I mean, just the, the dynamic of those two there back to back in the lineup, I think creates the potential to score a lot of runs. Acuna leads off the game with a walk and scores 76 run scored in the first inning this year by the Braves. He also had another walk and a hit in this one. Michael Harris had two more hits at the bottom of the lineup. He scored on a sack fly by Ozzie Albies. Michael Harris is now batting 266. That's a higher batting average than Ozzie, Austin Riley, Matt Olson, and Marcel Ozuna. He was batting 160 something at the beginning of June. He has raised his average over a hundred points in the month. It is just absolutely crazy. He has an OPS of 750, which it's also crazy because that's the lowest OPS in the starting lineup. It's 750, which is a really good OPS, and that's the lowest in this Braves lineup. But Michael Harris, what a tremendous month he has had. Changing of the guard in the bullpen as well. Yates came in to bridge the gap uh, to get out of that fifth inning and then got the sixth inning as well. Then you went to Mentor, and then you went to Joe Jimenez in the eighth inning over Nick Anderson. I've talked about the fact that I think Nick Anderson's losing a little bit of that trust in that setup role. So it was really interesting here that Snicker went to Jimenez. Anderson hadn't worked at all in this series. Maybe he just wanted to give him some more rest, but I thought it was pretty interesting that Snicker went with Jimenez in the eighth inning. Maybe he just thought it was a better matchup. I mean, both guys are righties, but they do it in different ways. One's fastball slider, one's fastball curve. But I thought that was interesting, that maybe we're seeing a changing of the guard in the bullpen a bit, and maybe we're starting to see that formation of Yates, Jimenez, Mentor, Iglesias becoming the new night shift. I mean, I don't think they deserve that label yet, but if you would have told me that at the beginning of the year, I'd have said, great, that's what the Braves imagined is that Yates would be that big setup guy. Jimenez was a guy they traded for to be a big setup guy, and then you were obviously counting on Iglesias being your closer and Mentor being one of your big setup guys. So I think when the season started, this is probably what they envisioned, having these four guys be their key guys out of the bullpen, and maybe now we're finally getting to that point. So we'll see how that plays out. Yates and Jimenez obviously have been much better here as of late. Mentor's been flat out dominant. Did a podcast earlier this week as well, talking about who you who can trust out of the bullpen. I mentioned Mentor and Iglesias are the two guys I have the most confidence in. And I mentioned that Yates is starting to creep up in that trust tree as well. All right, next, we are pretty much at the mathematical halfway point of the season. So we'll do our through Thursday through the league segment and I'll hand out the first half season awards. We'll do that here next. Buying tickets to your favorite event shouldn't be stressful, and it's not when you use Game Time, which is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. They have great deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, so you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting excited for all the fun you're going to have at your next event, just like I did. The couple of Braves games I've been to this year, I used Game Time to get last-minute tickets. It was very easy to do so and had a great time at the game the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price if you find tickets in the same section and row for less game time will credit you 110 percent of the difference get images of your seat before you buy download the game time app create an account and use code to lock down mlb for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account and redeem code at locked on mlb for 20 dollars off last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed Braves and Marlins will play on Friday night at 7.20 p.m. Eastern. Fish have been red hot here lately, and they're looking to catch the Braves in the NL East. Catch every pitch of the Braves' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM 
on the SXM app search Braves. It's been another great week on the podcast. We had our Miners Monday, our Taco Tuesday segment where we talked about the bullpen, our stat of the day Wednesday. We talked about the home run pace. The Braves are on tomorrow on Friday's episode. We'll have our mailbag, so be thinking about the questions you want to submit to have answered there. But it is Thursday, so it's our Thursday through the league, and we'll go by division by division, go over power rankings, and then I'll give out my first half awards. Braves lead the NL East by six and a half games over the Marlins, who they'll be playing this weekend. Braves are 53 and 27. They won five in a row, and they're nine and one in their last 10 games. Marlins, it's got to be somewhat frustrating as a Marlins fan. You're playing the best baseball you played in a long time. You're playing out of your mind, and you're still six and a half games back. You're 47 and 34. You've won four in a row. And again, they've been almost just as hot as the Braves this month, and they have lost ground in the NL East. The Phillies, 42 and 37. They've also had a really good month, and they find themselves 10 and a half games back in the NL East. They've won three in a row. The Mets, 36 and 44, 17 games back. They've won, or they're three and seven in their last 10. They are now closer to the Nationals, who are 32 and 48, 21 one games back, and they're five and five in their last 10 games. So that's the NL East right now. Braves have a pretty comfortable lead. They can make it even more comfortable with a series win this weekend over the Marlins. But they built themselves a little bit of cushion here that even if you were to lose a series against the Marlins, you're still in pretty good shape. You'd still be five and a half games up. Just can't get swept at this point. Division standings from around the league raised up four games on the Orioles and the AL East. After sweeping the Twins, the Braves helped the Guardians move into first place in the AL Central by just a half a game. Rangers are up six games on the Angels and Astros in the AL West. Reds and Brewers are tied for first in the NL Central with the Cubs three and a half back and the Pirates four and a half back. And the Diamondbacks on top of the NL West by four games over the Dodgers and Giants. So that those are your division standings from around the league. Now, as far as power rankings, these from the coming from the Athletic on June 26th, they have the Atlanta Braves now in the top spot. And I think the Braves had the best record for just a moment. The Rays had a comeback win over the Diamondbacks on Wednesday night. And I think they moved back in by uh, percentage points, but they're both right there neck and neck with the best record in all of baseball. But the, but the Athletic had the Braves one, the Rays two, the Rangers three, the Orioles four, the Diamondbacks five, the Giants six, the Dodgers seven, the Reds nine, uh, eight, the Marlins nine, and the Phillies ten. What a crazy power rankings. What a crazy season it's been. I talked about the changing of the guard earlier in the bullpen. You're somewhat seeing a changing of the guard in terms of the elite teams in baseball right now. You still have the Braves and Rays there at the top, and they've been there for several years now. But now you have the Rangers, the Orioles, the Diamondbacks, uh, the Reds, the Marlins are all in the top 10 right now, and we're halfway through the season. It's a long way to go. But where are the Astros? Where are the Yankees? Where are the Red Sox? Where are the offseason darlings and the Padres? Where are the Mets? Where are the Cardinals? These are all teams that many thought would be playoffs contenders. And again, we're halfway through the season. Maybe they could be, but to this point, they're not in the top 10 in the power rankings in all of baseball. So uh, it's been a crazy first half, and it's kind of fun to see some of these new teams here at the top with the Braves sticking around. Obviously, we'd love to see that. We are 80 games through the season, at least for the Braves standpoint. Be 81 on after Friday's game will be, be the mathematical halfway point of the season. But because we're going to do a mailbag episode then, I want to go ahead and hand out my first half awards today. So we'll start with the AL MVP. And this one I think is pretty cut and dry. It's Shohei Otani. I mean, just he is in a level of his own in terms of baseball royalty. You're talking about one of the best hitters in the game and one of the best pitchers in the game. It's the likes of something we've really never seen before. I wasn't old enough to see Babe Ruth and that, the era of baseball then is just so different from it is now anyway. What Otani is doing, I, I mean, again, it's it's never been done. He has 3.8 war, which is first in the American League, 180 WRC+, plus, which is first in Major League Baseball. 28 home runs is first in Major League Baseball as well. He has 55 runs scored, 64 runs batted in, and he has 11 stolen bases. He also gives you something in the speed department, and he's slashing 304, 386, 6 
54 slug percentage, 11.99 K per nine on the mound, which is first in the American League, and a 3.02 ERA and a 1.04 whip. I mean, case closed. I mean, it's, it's easily Shohei Otani. There's some of these I'm not con- certainly convinced on at this moment, but one thing I know, Shohei Otani is the AL MVP of the first half of the season. The NL MVP for the first half of the season, I think this one's pretty cut and dry, but some may think I'm biased. I think it's easily Ronald Acuna Jr. with the first half that he has put up. 4.3 F4, which is first in Major League Baseball. 164 WRC Plus is first in the National League. 19 home runs, that's fifth in the National League. 70 runs scored, that's first in all of Major League Baseball. 51 runs batted in. You, you know, He's a leadoff hitter, and he has over 50 RBI in the first half. That's six in the National League. I think a lot of that due to the fact that Michael Harris has been batting ninth and he's heated up here in the month of June. And Acuna is slashing 330, 404, 586. I know people want to make a case for a rise and what he's doing, flirting with 400. That is great. But I just, for me, Acuna is the easy choice for NL MVP right now. You disagree? Let me know in the comment section. But again, this is locked on Braves. Maybe I am a little biased, but I think it's easily Acuna in the first half of the season. AL Cy Young, both Cy Youngs, I think, are a lot more difficult, and we can have some discussions about this. I went with Framber Valdez of the Astros for the AL Cy Young, a 2.49 ERA, a 1.05 whip. I love both of those numbers. You're not giving up runs. You're not giving up a lot of base runners. A 2.90 XFIP as well. XFIP kind of takes out ballpark factors, defensive factors, all of that, and just uh, focuses on what the pitcher can control. And that's one of the best in baseball. 9.43 K per nine, 2.06 walk per nine is very good as well. 221 average against is solid. In consideration, though, I think you can make an argument for Kevin Gosman, a 301 ERA, a 1.13 whip, a 2.8 XFIP, and 11.95 K per nine. I think he certainly has an argument. And I think Otani has a case as well. 3.02 ERA, 1.04 whip. Matters are hitting just 179 against Shohei Otani. If he could really just cut down on the 3.68 walk per nine, I think Otani has a really good case to win the Cy Young, and you could see him win the MVP and Cy Young. So that would be pretty incredible to see. On the National League side, I honestly have no idea who should be the NL Cy Young right now, and I wish Spencer Strider hadn't have had those two really bad back-to-back starts because I think you would have a case for him. But right now... may give it to Clayton Kershaw. I mean, a 2.55 ERA, a 1.05 whip, a 215 average against 9.91 K per nine, 2.27 walk per nine, and a 3.22 X FIP. That's pretty solid work there from the veteran and Clayton Kershaw. I think Zach Gallen has a case to be made, a 3.02 ERA, a 1.09 whip, 9.32 K per nine, and just a 1.90 walk per nine for Zach Gallen is pretty crazy. Logan Webb, Marcus Stroman, they've both been good. I said if Spencer Strider gets that ERA back around three, I think he has a really good case to make just because of how dominant he's been leading the league in strikeouts. I think he still has the ability to get back in this NL Cy Young discussion. It's going to take him, you know, having several one earned or shutout starts, you know, in a row, I think, to get that ERA back down to where it needs to be. But the whip is there, the strikeouts are there. Just got to get that ERA back down a little bit. For AL Rookie of the Year, again, this is one I'm not really too sure of right now, but I went with Hunter Brown of the Astros. A 3.62 ERA, a 1.20 whip, 10.03 K per nine, uh, 3.10 walk per nine, and a 3.11 X FIP. Pretty solid for a rookie pitcher. So I went with Hunter Brown, but you can make an argument, I'm sure, for some others. Let me know in the comment section. For NL Rookie of the Year, it's This one's pretty clear to me. It's Corbin Carroll, 3.62 war, 17 home runs, 60 runs, 44 RBI, 23 stolen bases. I know a lot of people were putting him in the NL MVP discussion for a little bit. I think he's kind of fallen off some in the last week or so, or Acuna's just really taken off. But I think he's easily the NL Rookie of the Year right now. But watch out for Yuri Perez if Corbin Carroll would have kind of fall back a little bit in the second half and Yuri Perez continues to do what he has done for the Marlins. I think he could make a case as well for NL Rookie of the Year. For AL Manager of the Year, I want to Bruce Bochy. Rangers are kind of starting to pull away in what is a very good 
AL West out there. The Angels are playing better. The Astros are still a good team. I know they've struggled some this year. Mariners are a good team that are you know play have playoff uh, aspirations, and the Rangers are just kind of running away with things at the moment. I know they've spent a lot. They made some big moves, but you know one of those big moves is Jacob Degrom, and he's no longer there. He's out. So. I think what Bruce Bochy's done with this Rangers team and kind of leading that turnaround again, they've spent money. Uh, they're, you know, obviously have made moves to be this good, but to actually do it, uh, I think you got to give a lot of credit to Bruce Bochy for NL manager of the year. I think there's a lot of great candidates, but I think right now in the first half, you got to go with skip Schumacher of the, the Marlins first time managing. And he has that team believing. I, I still don't think they're the most talented team on paper, but, they just have this belief right now that they're going to win. I've watched several of their games this past month, and they have just found ways to win games and continue to do so. So he has built a belief there, I think, in this team that they are good, they can win, and that they're a good ball club. So excited to see them in this series this upcoming weekend. But I think I'd give first-half manager of the year to Skip Schumacher. Again, like I said, a lot of good candidates. Brian Snicker, I think, obviously, has done a great job. David Bell, Tori Lavolo of – uh, the Diamondbacks, David Bell of the Reds, I think have done great jobs as well. So those are my first half awards. We'll see if these guys can keep it up and be and win these awards at the end of the year. Hopefully that's the case for Ronald Acuna Jr. But those are my first half awards. Let me know who you would give these awards to in the comment section below on YouTube. And one other note, go vote your Braves for the All-Star Game. I think there's just a couple of days left to do that. Like I said, I'm not Huge on the All-Star game, but if they're going to have it, I want to see my Braves players there. So go vote your Braves into the All-Star game. All right, next, got a little bit of news. And Braden Shoemake making history at Gwinnett on Wednesday night. We'll talk about that here next. I mentioned earlier in the podcast, the Braves optioned Jared Schuster back to Gwinnett, and right now they have to be determined, listed as the starter for Friday night against the Marlins. Most people are speculating that it will be Michael Soroka. He's not currently listed in the rotation for Gwinnett, so seems pretty certain this time, even maybe even more so the Wednesday, that it will be Soroka who gets the start on Friday Reason the Braves kind of shuffled things around like this, and Mark Bowman did a great job kind of breaking this down in a tweet if you want to go find that. But this gives the Braves an opportunity to give both Strider and Morton extra rest and allow them to start against the Marlins and the Rays, who are two of their tougher opponents leading into the All-Star break. So that's kind of why they've done this shuffling. Went with Allard on Wednesday, give them an opportunity to go with Soroka on Friday and give Strider and Morton a little bit of rest leading into the All-Star break and line them up to go against the Marlins, who are chasing them in NL East, and the Rays, who are the other top team in Major League Baseball. So it makes a lot of sense there. And then Braden Shoemake on Wednesday night for the Gwinnett Stripers hit for the cycle, uh, the first one in the history of the Gwinnett Stripers. So great to see that there for him. Been struggling offensively for a while. There's a good article over on MLB Pipeline talking about the swing adjustments that he has made. Hopefully that's going to help him take off. We know the defense is there. We saw glimpses of the offense in spring training. And even right before he was called up earlier this year, he was starting to take off. And then it's been somewhat of a struggle for him since, since being sent back down. But hopefully this kind of kick starts him to get off on a good run and we see him have a good offensive season. So great to see that for Braden Shoemake. Braves will have a series against the Marlins this weekend, as I mentioned. Be a big series. I mean, the Marlins are the team closest to the Braves in the NL East, so it'll be an opportunity for the Braves to create some distance there. It'll be an opportunity for the Marlins to show what they've done over this past month is for real and that they're ready to take on the Braves. The Rays right now are 6-1 and one against the Marlins on the season, so Marlins got a lot of work to do in that regard, but should be a really fun series. We know the Marlins' great pitching staff, uh, so we'll see how these two match up over the weekend. Both have been red hot in June. Both have pretty good win streaks going at the moment as well. We'll have more to preview this series on Friday's podcast, but really looking forward to that one. Again, it'll be the Braves and the Marlins on Friday night starting at 7.20 p.m. Eastern. It looks like it'll be Michael Soroka on the mound for the Braves. Still not sure who's going to be there for the Marlins, but catch every pitch of the Braves' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app, Search Braves. 
That will do it for this episode of Lockdown Braves. Thanks so much for making us your first listen of each and every day. If you're an everydayer, let me know down in the comment section below. Make sure you follow the podcast on Twitter at Lockdown underscore Braves. Follow me at Shortstop Ball. Also, make sure that you rate, review, and subscribe to the Lockdown Braves podcast wherever you get your podcast. And we will talk to you next time.